everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we share with you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zhang. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. I'm back. Actually, I've been back for two weeks now, <laughs> but this is my first time on the actual show. <laughs> and we got Christian Harloff. I am enjoying that leather jacket, by the way. You're you. rocking that thing. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. I Mark Ellis. I was this Ellis. close to going leather jacket today. It's you Friday. You can't pull it off the way. I can pull it. Like Dennis, Dennis and I are in a Judas Priest cover band. You should see us. <laughs> I pay money to see that. <laughs> All right, here we go. The first official trailer for director Brian Singer's X-Men Apocalypse has finally arrived. The movie sees the return of James McAvoy, Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender, Nicholas Holt, Evan Peters, Rose Byrne, and Lucas Till. New to the franchise are Ty Sheridan, Olivia Munn, Alexandra Ship, Sophie Turner, Ben Hardy, Lana Condor, and Oscar Isaac as the main villain Apocalypse. This past July, both a Comic-Con only trailer and a Official photos released in Entertainment Weekly were met with much derision, mostly due to the appearance of Apocalypse. Apocalypse. X Men Apocalypse hits theaters next year on May 27, 2016. Dennis, what do you think of the trailer and does it help alleviate some of the concerns surrounding the look of Apocalypse? I like the trailer. I'm not blown away by anything, but it does one really important thing, which is kind of stop the bleeding from all the ridicule this. Uh, the original photos that came out, and I saw the Comic Con trailer. You, you were there at Comic Con as well. I was there witnessing it. I had not. I was not familiar with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers villain yeah. at the time. I was Me watching either. that, and then after people did side by side photos, I was like everybody else, like it kind of looks like. It. Yeah, I thought it kind of looked like a cross between Mister Freeze and that <laughs> Ivan Ooze Power Rangers. But I think what this does is it. it, it makes fans less nervous about this movie by showing off he looks less purple they make him a lighter shade of blue there's actually a shot in the trailer that has him in a huge huge size i i think it's it's funny because it's actually not that different from what we saw at comic-con the voiceover is very similar the tone of it's very similar they just added one, obviously a better looking apocalypse, but they also added some other shots in there. You saw like Archangel, you saw a Quicksilver in there, uh, Nightcrawler as well. Uh, what do you think, Mark? I loved watching this trailer. I got so excited to see this movie. From the way it opens with Sansa Stark, Sophie Turner, she's new to the cast and she looks great as a younger Jean Grey. Everything about the trailer story-wise made sense to me. I love that this is going to be the biggest battle that these mutants have ever fought and the way they build up the character of Apocalypse, how he's just biblical almost mythical figure that has come back to wreak havoc my favorite line in the trailer is when rose Byrne is talking about uh with james mcavoy and he's like oh wait it's kind of like the bible where you know the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then she's like well maybe they base the bible off of this dude and i went oh my god that sounds awesome as far as the look of apocalypse goes i was nervous the first minute and a half watching the trailer because it looked like they were trying to hide him mm -hmm. and i didn't want them this is how the character looks go ahead and show him to us and then towards the end of the trailer we got some more full view shots of him that one shot of looking up at apocalypse and you're right when he gets big it looked very impressive so i never hated the look of the character again i wasn't that familiar with the power rangers before i saw this trailer so to me i've always been on board with this movie and this trailer sold me even more christian i didn't love the trailer and, uh, and <laughs> at all tried so hard i know it's good try uh, yes for me it's i i love the story i thought this the story i agree with you they set it up well but i disagree with both of you guys i think that they hid apocalypse the whole entire time i don't think that it, it's gonna anybody who had problems or, or was nervous about him before i think they're still gonna be nervous about him because they didn't show him enough to say okay there his voice sounded fine i like i liked his voice i like that shot you're talking about dennis to where he's he's bigger and they're, they're kind of showing how powerful he is but i think that they were so nervous from the backlash that they got from him he's not in full shot speaking you don't really see him appearing as a as a full-fledged villain the other newer characters it's fine. We'll we'll see them, and we'll and once I'm still very excited about the movie. I think the movie's gonna be great. I was just kind of I was expecting this big, epic trailer for the the movie that just kind of has to follow Days of Future Past, and for 
the movie that's following Days of Future Past, I didn't love it. But let me ask you, you gents, this is because like, let's pretend we don't live in an internet age and social media when everybody can see a clip of something and immediately start bashing it and it gets in our heads. If this was the first thing you'd seen of Apocalypse, and for most people who weren't at Comic Con, this should have been the first thing you saw, would you feel like they're trying to hide a villain or they're just making him mysterious in a cool way? I, I think it's uh, maybe <laughs> making him mysterious, but I think there's a reason why we don't see that's Apocalypse. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because I think they never intended to make him look like the way he does now. I think, remember, they had that Comic-Con trailer, right? Only people, a select few people got to see it. Then they released that EW photos. That Those were full-on shots of Apocalypse, and he didn't look anything like this. He looked totally different. Mm -hmm. And I think the backlash from that, they're like, oh, wait, we need to fix this thing. And I think the reason why we don't see so much of him in this trailer they're is still fixing yeah, it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is not planned. They no. didn't go around and go, oh, yeah, this is how he always was going to look. No, well, they heard from fans. Yeah, and I think, well, that's the, the question that Mark has on the table. If this was the first thing we've ever seen of him and they were, and it looked like they were strategically sh saying he's in the shadows, then of course I'd be excited about that. But that's clearly not the reason. <laughs> it's because, oh, everyone hates this. It's like when Brian Singer worked Worked on Superman Returns, and he's like, "Oh, people are gonna love this Superman suit," and they hated it. And then it was like, "Oh, you, but back then it was a little different to where how much internet uh, exposure stuff was getting." And with this movie, I just wanted so much more. I thought it was fine. I didn't hate it, and I still very excited about the movie. Yeah, and I acknowledge that I'm in the the very tiny minority where I never had a problem with the way Apocalypse looked from the start. But I think the lesson we've learned here is that never let Entertainment Weekly shoot your movie no, when it's seriously. in production. Man. They just don't do a good job. So with they it. did good with Star Wars, though. Anything does good with Star Wars. Did you yeah. see the Terminator Jenny Smith picks? You're right. Uh, yeah, I I did have a problem with the original look of it. He did right. He right. I remember so, you having the he, problem. He didn't yeah. look like menacing or intimidating at all. And and they and they totally put him in that the the cover of Entertainment Weekly. So they weren't trying to hide it. Now they're like realizing, okay, we have we have to fix this. And yeah, I, I think the next trailer we'll see sometime next year will have more of Apocalypse because they will have worked on it. Yeah. It's gonna be tough. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know what I'm actually most most nervous about though, and I mentioned this uh, a long time ago was the mind control aspect of, of the storyline. I don't like mind control when it comes to s stories because it gives it doesn't give any motivation for characters, right? So if they if you see Magneto and some of the other characters that decide to follow Apocalypse. They're they're not doing it out of their own free will. Right. They're doing it because they're being mind controlled, and that to me just. It's not intriguing. But even I agree a mind-controlled Magneto looks like, I, and I, that was one of my favorite parts of the trailer too. Is seeing Michael Fassbender where he just looks like, man, he, I'm I'm a powerful mutant, and even I am having trouble reconciling what's happening. I think that right that's now. the thing that I enjoyed about. It. That's all the other thing I really enjoyed was finally seeing McAvoy as bald Professor X. That was that was cool too. That um, was yeah, that was a great that, that was final pretty shot. awesome. But I think that normally I agree with you where it's like ah, they're, they're not doing it on their own free will. But we've seen Magneto so many different times doing this and going off and saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not listening to you guys. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. And we also, from the events of what happened in Days of Future Past, I also want to know, does he get you know, broken out? <laughs> like, what, what happens? How many times they can break this guy out of prison? <laughs> Have so, they moved RFK Stadium back right, to where it rested? Right, but I think that this mind control thing might, I don't know, it, it, it might work for Apocalypse, but I, I know where you're coming from. And how did you guys like Archangel? The I thought, I thought the had. look of Archangel yeah. was phenomenal. Like and, and again, we didn't get to see that much of that no. either, but the tease of it was great. The, the big issue I have with this trailer might be when, because this is the one that's going to be attached to The Force Awakens when it opens, so you're going to have a packed theater opening weekend, the second weekend for Christmas, and everybody's seeing the look of Apocalypse towards the end for the first time. Will he get booed? No. I hope not. No, no, no it's too no, short. No. It's too short to get booed? Not only that, I, I think this is a massive improvement over the last one. Maybe yeah. the yeah. other one yeah. would have got booed. You know what I thought was an improvement? because we, I think we all sold the look of it. I thought Nightcrawler looked cool. I thought, night, because with the pictures they showed of Nightcrawler, I think it was an Entertainment Weekly, also looked like bad cosplay. Mm -hmm. And the way that it transferred over in the trailer, I thought looked good. Okay, all right, what's next? Variety is reporting that multiple Oscar-winning actress Kate Blanchett is in talks to play one of the female leads in the upcoming Marvel films, Thor Ragnarok. Chris Hemsworth returns as a lead actor Thor, and the third of the character's solo movies outings is being directed by Taika Watiki. Thor Ragnarok comes to theaters on November 3rd, 2017. Christian, what do you think of the possibility of Kate Blanchett joining Thor Ragnarok? I hate it. No! <laughs> of course not. I love it. How do you not want Kate Blanchett in everything that you do the only thing that i've ever been like well they didn't use her the right way was in indiana jones and crystal skull but i don't think anybody could have saved that thing um i think that it's 
that's exactly who you need to add to this movie, what she did in, in Lord of the Rings. Anytime she's in a movie, she adds so much gravitas to it. And she is just one of those actresses, one of the best working today. She's going to be all over the Oscars this year as well with Carol. Mm -hmm. she's, this, and this is what she does. She's able, she does movies. She's a very smart actress. She's very, she, she'll do a role, to, whether it be Truth or, or a movie like, uh, like Carol, and then she'll do a big budget movie. And, she, and she's another one where I said with Tom Cruise, always gives 100%. Never looks like she's phoning it in ever. So far, even with Crystal, oh, she was trying, <laughs> you know, but she wasn't phoning it in. So, yeah, how do you not? We're not doing it, but bye, 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 bye. Yeah, I also would buy it as yeah. well. She's one of my favorite actresses today. She's one of the best working. She has, what, three Oscars, I think? One for Elizabeth, one for oh, Aviator, right. and then one for Blue Jasmine. Right, right. I'm gonna say I'm gonna right. say she has umpteen Oscars. Yeah, and I'm sure she's been nominated multiple times. And I've been hearing she's fantastic in Carol. I haven't seen that yet, but I guess that's. Is it out in limited release? It right is. Now? You yeah. can check it out at, at, at select theaters in LA, and then we got a screen. We're going to check weekend, out. Yeah. We're okay. going to watch Carol together. Uh, we will not. It, oh. no. <laughs> but but yeah, I think she's <laughs> it, it, she's like, they're bringing all these these actors that you never thought would be in comic movies, and she's never been in one before. But she's been in genre films like you mentioned, Lord of the Rings, Indiana Jones. Right. This is her first comic movie. But you know, we see Michael Douglas and Robert Redford and all these people. So. Yeah, I think it's a good addition. I'm so excited. Now I'm just thinking about which character she's going to play. I definitely want you to be in the movie. I don't care who you are. Be in the film. Once she gets in the film, will she be good? Will she be evil? She was so good as the evil queen or whoever that was, the wicked stepmother in Cinderella. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's like, I kind of want to see her maybe play one of the Valkyries. I know oh, the internet's been on fire saying she might be a Mora. I don't know who she's going to be, but seeing her square off against Thor, Chris Hemsworth, have his biggest challenge yet, be somebody like Kate Blanchett is just so promising. Or him. even the teaming up with him. I agree that going up against him would be great. Like, like a Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, they teamed up together as well, too. Mm. Anything she does will be great. What, what do you guys think of John we, in our pre-production meeting today? He mentioned, what about death? What if she plays death to, to, to Thanos? I'm in, man. Yeah, I'm in. why not? I, like, literally. Anything. That's the way Anything. I want to go out. Is Kate Blanchett the last thing I see? I'm cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, guys. We're actually not doing any buy or sell today, but uh, we're going to move on to our box office predictions. This is a segment brought to us by our friends at AMC Theaters where we predict the top five box office winners for this upcoming weekend. So, Mark, uh, who do you think is going to be winning this, this this weekend? Man, this is really tough because there's a great movie coming out in theaters this weekend called The Big Short, but I don't know that it's going to be number one at the box office. I think In the Heart of the Sea is going to take the top spot. I think Hunger Games Mockingjay is going to stay at number two, barely over not Krampus, Creed, I think, is going to be in the number three spot. At four, I'm going to have Krampus. And then at five, I'm going to have the big short. Christian? Um, I think you were close. Oh, but thanks, I think man. You're close. Uh, in the heart of the sea, I think we'll be number one. I think you're right. It's the opening movie. Uh, then I got the Hunger Games coming in at two. Then I have the Good Dinosaur. It's the only thing for kids to see this weekend really out there. So I think Good Dinosaur will hold at three. Then Creed, and then Strong, and then ending with Krampus. I don't think Big Short's in enough theaters. Okay, mine's very up. similar to yours. I have In the Heart of the Sea, number one, Hunger Games, Mocking J Part 2, but I have Creed as number three instead of The Good Dinosaur. Okay. I, I think Creed, there's a lot of good word of mouth, a lot of buzz behind it. I saw The Good Dinosaur. I liked it, but it's, it's very forgettable for me, other than the, the Cliché visuals. Cliché, too. Yeah. I, I just think it's something I don't know if a lot of people are going to go back to. And I think Creed is something that I, I've already seen it twice. I don't know how mm -hmm. many times you guys have seen twice. it. Yeah, Eight. <laughs> yeah, I think people are, are, are going, you know, uh, crazy for this movie. And so I think it's going to do that. Uh, Good Dinosaur number four and Krampus number five. So. You know, what we got to do. We were trying to talk to we were talking to John about this as well, too, is it's once we get to Monday, see who won yeah. and start and start keeping records. Well, and you got to remember, there's a slight, slight chance that I may have forgotten about the good times. Or <laughs> but I'm going to go with my picks. I'm going to kick that down. I mean, Arlo, I love you to death, buddy. You're going to be number six just behind Ryan Gosling and company. But isn't the big short in limited yes. release? Yes. Yeah. It, look, Dennis, I'm not saying it's the favorite, okay? okay? I like Apocalypse. Nobody else does. I think the big short's going to be the top five. I'll go see it 100 times. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, in our next segment, I actually wanted to let you guys know something uh, cool that Collider is doing. Collider is teaming up with IMAX, and we're actually doing a screening series. Uh, 
where we, we're showing new movies and classic movies. I think uh, we're doing it about once a month. There you see uh, Steve Frosty Weintraub, who's the editor-in-chief of Collider.com, the website. That's Francis Lawrence, the director of Mockingjay Part 2, uh, the Hunger Games movie. And uh, every month uh, we're looking to do a, a screening series, uh, kind of a more intimate type of thing, where there's they screen the movie on an IMAX screen, and then there's a Q&A with the filmmakers right after that. So it, it, it's something kind of cool. Take a look at the Collider website for your chance to win some tickets for that. And uh, yeah. Uh, next up, we're going to do a uh, mailbag. But before that, uh, we're going to talk about, or not talk about, but we have live Twitter questions we're going to do after mailbag. But uh, remember, you can email it at us at uh, collidervideo uh, at gmail.com to get your answers, uh, questions answered on the show. Uh, for now, uh, Natasha, what do we got? Okay, Phil D writes, Hi guys, been watching you guys every day for years. With the success of Creed in the Rocky franchise, if they do another one with Michael B. Jordan starring as Donnie Creed, do you think we could see Ivan Drago make an appearance? Not in a boxing role, but keep it more of a dramatic role like they did with Rocky in the recent one. Something like Rocky introducing Donnie to Drago because Drago to make amends for killing Apollo. I would think that would be a situation in the Creed family storyline, especially with Dolph Lundgren still close with Stallone and making all of these Expendables movies. Thanks. Christian, what do you think of that idea? His idea I love. I don't want to see him be a villain. I don't want to see him, like, is that you can cross over into Cheese Factor right now. Now, look, I know I'm going to get a big gasp here. You will. And I love watching Rocky IV. Christian. It is by far Easy. the four movies the cheesiest and, oh, and works so God. well for the times. It fit the. It, it was a perfect 80s movie. It really was. I mean, the, the entire, all the Russians decided they're going to cheer for Rocky at the end of the movie, and then he ends the Cold War. It was amazing. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, it's, it's Rocky IV is one of the a, best documentaries it, ever. It, documentaries. It's a lot of fun, and I love watching it. But, you know, we got to be, from, especially what they did with Creed, they based a lot of it in realism. And when if you bring Drago in, that he is apologetic and that they are, who knows what's happened to him in the last 30 years. I'd be very interested. You remember also, Stallone loves bringing back old characters. He was supposed to bring back Clubber Lang in Rocky Balboa, just as like a commentator, but Mr. T wanted like a ridiculous amount of money, so it never happened, um, which I don't understand, Mr. T, what are you doing? <laughs> but I, would, I think it's a great idea. I think that it also helps further the story and some more closure for Adonis. Mark, my heart's on fire. There's a strong desire raging deep within oh to see Von Drago come back to the Rocky franchise. Have him call Rocky Balboa out, then Rocky can get him out of retirement again, and they can fight for a second time. Short of that, I would love to see him come back in some capacity. Think about if he does have regrets for killing Apollo yeah. in the ring, if he <laughs> feels bad about it. The meeting between Adonis Creed and the guy who accidentally, though it may have been, killed his dad in the ring. <laughs> It, it was accidental. He wasn't trying to kill. I mean, he, he held him up. He was. Just, he could have just let him fall. He, I, mean, I mean, yeah. It, it it didn't. It wasn't totally on purpose. I think he was just trying to teach him a lesson, <laughs> like how to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the lesson became Cape Blanchett from Thor walking up and bringing him off. Yeah. But I would love to see Dolph Lundgren come back to this franchise in some capacity. Yeah, I'm with Christian. Where I, I'm more with Phil. I'd like that to see it as more of a dramatic purpose where he comes back, wants to make some amends. He's, I don't want to see some sort of like mini Ivan Drago no, come up, God, like no. either Drago's son or some sort of Russian boxer that's like up and coming and wants to fight Creed. That would be cheesy. I agree with you. I love watching Rocky IV. I know people bash on it all the time. I, I think some people would find this, you know, uh, blasphemous, uh, but I, I, I like. I think the training sequence in Rocky IV is my favorite it's one. It's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there's pretty much the two mountain, back to back. Where he's climbing the yeah. mountain. <laughs> he's yeah, he's the got. Best. He's like carrying the the wood, and then it, they're contrasting with Drago inside the uh, facility yeah. with the steroids the and all that yeah. stuff. I love the cheese. The ending speech with the "If I can change, <laughs> you can change." change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. Love it. Uh, but yeah, you're right. With Creed, it has to be more realistic. That's the, you know you have to bring Kugler back. You got to maintain that same tone that they had in the first one. You can't do, you know, the cheesy Cold War thing from the you know, 80s. And you say that, though, too. And like there are some movies that work with other directors. There are some that that don't. I think that Coogler is one. If you're going to do sequels for Creed, you lock him up for as many sequels as you can get. 
because of his passion and the way that he is responsible for bringing this back. It's him. It's not Stallone. It is Ryan Coogler who had this idea. Stallone wanted to put it to bed. Yeah. So you have Coogler, and, and from everything that Coogler did, being such a fan of the first movie and what he did and the parallels that you saw with the first one, I wouldn't, I'd be okay with the, a, a lot of the parallels from the other movies kind of taking bits and cherry picking from those movies and putting it into the new movies, still standing on its own. But what if Drago doesn't really show up until like the third Creed movie mm-hmm. and almost serves the same type of role that, uh, uh, you know, Apollo Creed did when Rocky eventually might go. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe who knows? This Drago Christian. being. I'm just, <laughs> just saying. You never know what role Drago could serve. All right. All right. What's next? All right. Gabriel Mizell writes Hi, guys. I love the show. Some people say that Christopher Nolan is becoming the new Stanley Kubrick. Do you agree with that? Thanks and keep up the good work. Uh, I don't think so. I'm a fan of Christopher Nolan's, but I think he's a kind of a ways off from Stanley Kubrick. Um, there are similarities, I think, kind of in visual style and tone, but Kubrick, you know, he's one of the all time greats, you know, and, and a lot of, I mean, we think of his classic movies like 2001, Clockwork Orange, Full Metal Jacket, but he also had different tones to him, like with Lolita, Spartacus, Dr. Strangelove, and we haven't seen that from Christopher Nolan yet. Um, with uh, Interstellar, there was a lot of references and kind of homages to 2001 but for me that movie ended up being more spielberg like than kubrick like so i don't know what do you guys think i mean i could see the comparison between 2001 and interstellar from a cinematic standpoint i can see how kubrick and christopher nolan are very similar but thematically i think kubrick did so many different things i just haven't seen yet with christopher nolan yet i'm not saying that that can't happen because christopher nolan is still one of the very few directors that would get me into a theater on name alone it doesn't matter what the title of the movie is if christopher nolan's doing it i want to go see it opening night Christian? They're completely different. They're completely different filmmakers, and I think Nolan will be recognized as Nolan and not as the next Kubrick and because they have s- very different styles, and I think the reason that that conversation comes up is because of Interstellar and 2001 and because it was like an homage, and there were similarities for sure. Um, but no, he and I also think that Christopher Nolan goes more into the, can can dive more into the blockbusters and get the commercial mm-hmm. feels way more than Kubrick did um, because that's the kind of filmmaker that Nolan is. Like You look at something like uh, uh, Inception, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, that was a summer blockbuster movie, but it was also very deep and, and it, very different from most blockbusters, which gave him his own style, but that wasn't something that Kubrick really did a lot of as well, too. Um, so I think their styles are significantly different. I don't see a lot of similarities. It's funny, though, when you look at, and you and I have been arguing about this often, I think David O. Russell is a guy that's starting to do a lot more, take a lot more from Scorsese oh, than yeah. he's done lately. Like, even with Joy, there's a lot of Scorsese-isms, and I, I don't know what he's doing lately. It's like everything he's doing is more like, I'm going to take that from Scorsese. I'm going to take that. And I don't think that Nolan does that. I think Nolan... I don't know. Nolan, I think, stands on his own away from Kubrick. Yeah, no, Nolan makes a lot more Batman movies <laughs> yeah, true. than Kubrick does. Yeah, I think this is a conversation maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, maybe we can see what Nolan has done since then and what his impact is. I mean, obviously, he's influential on modern filmmakers today, but Kubrick is, like I said, all time. Like, everyone is influenced by his work. Right, but I think it's a different conversation. I think there's a different conversation even in 10, 15 years if it's, does Nolan fit in with the... Kubrick's and Coppola's mm-hmm. and people of that. That's a different conversation as far as like is is he the next Kubrick in regards to the same style and the same and and do you feel that like you're watching Kubrick movies when you're watching Nolan stuff? Do you get that sense of oh this reminds me? I agree with you like it, that you can get bits. Oh wait, but that reminds me of Spielberg or that mm-hmm. there's influence a, a, around it. As far as him being in the conversation mm-hmm. with Kubrick, then let's see 10, yeah, 15 years. Yeah. But as far as being the next Kubrick, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and also, like I said, I want to see him do some other movies. I mean, Kubrick, you had Lolita, uh, Doctor Strangelove, which were more like tongue-in-cheek, some right. satire, right. comedy. No one hasn't done any kind of comedy, and most of his movies have very little comedy in them. He knows what he does. Yeah, He knows what he does, and that's not, that's not his strong point. Yeah. All right, what's next? Michael Bay does comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Tries. 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 <laughs> Jamie Rye writes, Hey, all at Movie Talk, viewer from England here. 
Now that the X-Men Apocalypse trailer has been released, which 2016 comic book movie do you st- do you think had the better trailer? I have to go for Suicide Squad. The soundtrack to it, the look at all the characters, and of course the Joker did it for me as well as giving nothing away. Apocalypse trailer won me over as he looks nowhere near as daft as he did in the promotional photos. Not a fan of Oscar Isaac's Apocalypse voice choice, though. Keep up the good work, and oh my god, only six more days till I see Star Wars! Exclamation point, exclamation. <laughs> Point. All right, Mark, what's your favorite comic book uh, movie trailer well, of the if year? Well, if we're talking about the most recent ones that came out, it's a pretty good fight between the most recent Batman v Superman and X-Men Apocalypse. I might give the slight edge to Apocalypse just on the recent trailers because of what Batman v Superman gave away, whereas Apocalypse didn't give away too much. If we're going to have more of a fair fight, I think it's definitely between Suicide Squad's Comic-Con trailer and Batman v Superman's Comic-Con trailer. I'm going to give the slight edge to Batman v Superman simply because... It's got Batman and Superman in it. But Suicide Squad looks great, too, in the trailer. The trailer really sold me on on the look that David Ayer is going for. For recent ones, I would actually have to go with uh, Marvel's uh, Captain America Civil War. Right, right. Uh, overall, I would go with the Batman v Superman trailer, the Comic-Con version. Mm-hmm. I, I, was, I think I'm the only one at Clyde that did not like that Batman v Superman trailer that just got released. I didn't like the tone of it. I didn't like the editing. I didn't like that they revealed so much. I just, it, it didn't, it actually made me a little more nervous. I'm still excited about seeing the film, but I'm, I'm I'm a little more nervous. And when I tweeted out that I didn't like it, man, half the people were were with me, and the other half were like, "You're crazy, Dennis. What's wrong with you?" I, I don't know. I just I, I didn't feel. I'm it sorry, at all. man. I get drunk on Twitter yes. sometimes. Yes. I apologize. It's a three way fight for me. I got Civil War up there for sure. I got uh, Suicide Squad and Deadpool. Those are the three for me that I I think because to me the Deadpool trailer is everything that I wanted to see as far as this character goes. And the reason I like Deadpool and Suicide Squad so much is because they're brand new. We haven't seen a Deadpool movie. Suicide Squad, to have the villains running the uh, running the show is, is going to be a lot of fun. The tie-in to Batman versus Superman, I'm really excited. And, and after seeing Fury and watching what David Ayer did for that mm-hmm. movie, um, those are the two that I really am looking forward to. And I thought their trailers painted a great picture. But Civil War... Unlike both Apocalypse and Batman v Superman, this is a franchise I'm already familiar with, but still wanted made me feel like it was brand new and I wanted to see more of it. And it's furthering the story in that moment between Captain America and Tony Stark yeah. and it was, it's uh, Winter Soldier at the end. Yeah, Civil War to me, I thought, was the best trailer to paint what they're upcoming. It's pretty much so. It, it's great when you're a comic book fan and you can be like, oh, yeah, the trailer I like the least is the one that maybe gave away a little bit too right. much. They All all these <laughs> movies are definitely going to be on my most anticipated of 2016 list. If we can include the trailer and the pregame speech before the trailer, it would definitely be David Ayer for Suicide Squad. Oh, remember, remember in Comic-Con? Yes. He got on stage before showing the trailer, and I love the confidence, the bravado that he knows he made a great film because he's up there and he's just talking about how great villains are and Marvel, that other company's got a bunch of heroes, but we got the bad guys, and he was ready to go. Yeah, What also what I liked about the Marvel Civil War trailer is that it it does show Captain America versus Iron Man. That's kind of the main focus right. of that trailer, where Batman v Superman, we kind of lost that in mm-hmm. the most recent one. Cut out that last 20 seconds, and it was a different conversation, for, for me anyway. I still didn't like the Lex L- Luthor tone. Okay. Dennis wants joking. to cut out the, the last two minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> oh. All right, what's next? Lee DeWald writes, I was watching a behind-the-scenes video of a recent episode of The Walking Dead where a talking head was mentioning that a stunt they filmed for said episode would normally take a movie one week to shoot, and The Walking Dead crew was able to complete it in one day. This got me to thinking about a rant John Campia had a month or so ago, complaining about how the budgets of movies are ballooning to obscene costs. First question, wouldn't it behoove film students to adopt the television style of shooting scenes at a quicker pace? I would think this would lower costs, maybe not by much, but at least it's something. Second question, why does it take a movie a week to film a stunt when a television show can do it in a day? I know television is in a time crunch to get episodes filmed every seven to to ten days, but there has to be more to it than just that. Thanks everyone at Collider and keep up the outstanding work. Well, the question, uh, the answer to your question is quality. I mean, that's the thing. I'm actually not a person. I don't like for me. I love movies. I love television. I, they both have advantages and disadvantages to each of them. So I'm not a person that's like, oh, yeah, movies are better. Or television's better. I, I like them equally. However, one of the main advantages that movies have is time and money. And when you 
want to do an action sequence, especially because you're asking people to leave their home and pay money and sit in a theater. There's there's a lot to go see a movie. In order to do that, you have to deliver on something they can't see at home. And what can't they see at home is these kind of spectacle scenes, like a lot of visual effects and, and having these action sequences done well. And in order to do them well, you've got to take your time. Where in television, they are on a schedule. They've got to pump these things out so you'll see a lot of subpar i'm not saying all movies have better action television but it's general it's a general rule that they spend much more time and they just have more quality there what do you guys think and let's not forget the team that the talking head in question is on they're definitely talking about how great the walking dead is and how quickly they are at making stunts happen but you should if you're going to skimp something on movie sets there's thousands of places where you can cut costs and you don't have to worry about the safety of the stunt players because that should be paramount on any movie set they should get all the time in the world to set up the stunt properly to execute it as many times they see fit if you need to cut costs on a movie set serve flank steak instead of filet and also understand that they are six seasons into the show so they have a, a working relationship they know their teams they know what they're able to do what they're capable of doing with these movies you know it's anywhere it takes six months to a year to film these things and sometimes it's a brand new crew sometimes it's 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 new people coming in but i think that it really hits on the points that you made dennis is that it's it's more time it's more money there's more involvement there's more risk Sometimes a lot in, with with the movies, um, not that there's not risk in television, but whereas if you're going to have a bad episode in TV, it's like okay, well, let's let's work on the next one. Let's see what, what do we do wrong there. Let's let's make sure that we can figure this out. As where it's one shot film, that scene it's gone. You're not you're not going to have another shot to do it unless you get the sequel down the line. You want to make some more improvements. So I think that you're right. I think it's more about the time and it's the money and. You can tell the, TV, the difference between TV. And even you look at something like Game of Thrones, which when you go back to season two with the Battle of Blackwater, very rare that you get television that looks like that. That was a film quality, and that was a very expensive scene. They had to put a lot of money into the scene. They had to cut a lot of stuff in order to put the money into that scene. So it, it's really about budget, and, the, and when you see certain shows that have smaller budget, you can tell. Yeah, and speaking of Game of Thrones, they did that also with... That one uh, episode that was at the wall, where it was like the big fight with the giants and the oh, right, the, right. the people from uh, beyond the wall, uh, the wildlings. But out of ten episodes, they can only afford to do that once. Right. And, and even you know, by TV standards, Game of Thrones is kind of more of the exception than the rule because they got a lot more money, a lot more. They give them more time. Right. Where if you're talking about network TV, where you're doing twenty episodes a season. They don't have And time we're not even for talking that. about network TV. We're talking about AMC, who probably doesn't right. have nearly the production budget that HBO does, much less something of a major motion picture. Well, they, Game of Thrones is looked at within the nine or ten episodes they do per season as very cinematic. Yeah. And where I think that, and Walking Dead is what, 22 episodes? 16. 16, 16 episodes. Yeah. But still, it's, it's significantly more. That's why and, Walking Dead, sometimes they just have those episodes where nothing no, happens. Nothing happens. Yeah. Because they Literally just, nothing happens. Yeah, it's like the they, they, they probably try to stunt, and they're like, uh, the stunt didn't work. Sorry. Right. Here's Morgan hanging out wearing an Aikido. Yeah, and if you notice, Game of Thrones. <laughs> Thrones keep every year this premiere gets pushed back a week two mm -hmm. weeks this this year it's I think the end of April now and it's because Game of Thrones yeah because they want to take the time for to, to to make things better right they still do a great job on on, on Walking Dead oh, yeah it's just, for sure it's just that maybe maybe if you're gonna cover yourself in zombie guts maybe do the head too just to be safe or do it every day <laughs> if it works do it every day yeah all right, guys, now on to live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video on Twitter, and Natasha will pick out some questions for you. Natasha, what do we got? Annie writes, what two actors would you love to see team up in a movie? I pick Christopher Walken and John Malkovich, possibly playing brothers. Tom Hardy and Fassbender. No, oh, that'd be In a drama, good. like something pretty, pretty like, you know, I don't want to see a comedy. We, we did that with Chris Pine and Tom Hardy, and it didn't work out. <laughs> I was going to say Van Damme and Seagal, but I will also go with uh, Tom Hardy, your boy, and Mel Gibson. I just want to see some crazy on crazy action. That would be epic. Uh, I would like to see two of my favorite actors, Sam Rockwell and Edward Norton. Edward Norton doesn't yeah. do nearly enough movies. I mean, he was great in Birdman. Sam Rockwell is a very mm -hmm. underrated actor. I think those two together in some sort of buddy movie where buddy comedy slash action Poltergeist 2? Poltergeist. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. All right, what's next? All right, Secrets Fan writes, if Ghost in the Shell is good, do you think we will see more anime live action movies like video games? Uh, possibly. I mean, Akira is the one that's always on everyone's top of the list uh, on 
it's it's one of those things where yeah you need some sort of breakout movie like with video games they need warcraft or assassin's creed to do well maybe ghost in the ghost in the shell or a kira movie can help help bridge that i 100 percent. if it if ghost in the shell it, it's got to be a mega hit though yeah if it's a mega hit then yes you're gonna see the studios well what else is out there it's just it's just the way it works yeah it may not it may not satisfy hardcore anime fans no. it'd be to see their material lifted and then adapted into something else that they didn't want to see in the first place but it also it's nice to see whatever property you root for get more recognition i know there's tons of fans of not only akira and ghost in the shell dragon ball z fans as my mm-hmm. girlfriend can attest to they want to see better live action films maybe it'll happen if ghost in the shell is good all right, what's next? Okay, we got from Cinema Commander. Do you think that Creed has a legitimate shot at a Best Picture nomination this year? I think there's a little chance. I don't. I don't know. I wouldn't. If I had to put money on it, I'd say no. I know for myself, it's in my top ten movies list, but I don't know if the Academy is gonna that movie and Mad <coughs> Max Fury Road are two movies mm-hmm. that I think deserve to be in the conversation. I just don't know if the Academy Award uh, voters are going to do it. I would love to see it. I think Mad Max is a better shot than Creed does. Um, and that's just because of what we're seeing so far in these early awards and nominations, too. I'm with you. It's in my favorites of the year as well. I think Stallone is a lock for Best Supporting Actor. I would say a lock. I think he's going to definitely be nominated. I don't know if he's going to win, but he'll be nominated. And I'd like to see Michael B. Jordan get nominated, and I'd like to see Cougar get nominated. There's so much, but I don't think anyone except Stallone's getting nominated. Yeah, I mean, the, the even the, the best supporting actor race is just so stacked. It, it's I think Stallone might get that fifth nomination. I think that's as high as it goes. I don't think he's going to win, unfortunately. I don't see Cougar getting nominated for best director simply because that is maybe the most stacked best director race yeah. I've seen in a long time. But best picture, you got 10 possible slots. Maybe Creed could sneak in there. I think Mad Max would get in there before Creed, but if they could be 9 and 10, who knows? Don't you guys think kind of the iconic Rocky, because it's Rocky, that's why it's not? Imagine, let's say Creed came out and no one knew about Rocky at all. There was no Rocky movies. It had just come out on its own and stands on its own. Do you think it would get nominated? I don't know if it's, 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 that's such a tricky question. I don't know if it can stand on its own because one of the great things, it was, a, it was like a, a mixture. It was part of it and it was, it paralleled the story. Yeah. Part of it was the nostalgia purposes and being part of the Rocky family. And the other part of it was standing on its own. So it was when like the goosebumps and stuff I got for me was the way that they tied it in together and the nostalgia of Rocky and watching what he's gone through because I'm so invested in him as a character already. So. I don't know if it, it's certainly a great movie. I just don't know you have the same emotional attachment to it if the other ones don't exist. Dennis, I refuse to comment on a universe that does not have Rocky <laughs> right. movies in it. All right. We have another one. Okay. Kylo writes, hi, Kylo. guys. <laughs> Love the show. Do you think virtual reality has any future in films? Ever? Yes. Yes. And it would probably be some sort of choose your own adventure type of movie. It'd just be something different, much kind of a merging of video games and filmmaking that we have today and, and having them merge together where there are multiple outcomes and multiple things that can happen. The stuff they're doing now with the little wine boxes on your head and you're moving mm-hmm. around and you're going around inside and you, it, the way that looks now, that's like the early, that's like a Coleco vision basically of the time, you know, and then you go. 20, 30 years into the future from now, absolutely you're going to have movies and interactive. Mm. They're working on that stuff. That's that's the next wave of technology is virtual reality. 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, absolutely. Oh, yeah. As my 14-year-old daughter says, it's about to get cray-cray, y'all. I mean, the way that you're going to experience movies in the future. Now, let's go further. Let's go 100 years. Will there still be people going to the movie theater just to sit and watch a movie? Or will you actually live it? It's Movies might start getting athletic. Right. Like, if you go you see could be Star John Wars, McClane. yeah, you, you're actually in the movie. You're the one that has to run away from the TIE Fighters mm. and, and, and hang out with BBA. It's like, like Strange Days. It's going to be crazy. And I'm so lazy. I don't know that I want to see that. I just want to see the action <laughs> happening. I don't want to actually participate. It's way too hard. Yeah, I don't think it's going to replace what we have as movies today, but I think it might become something just much like how video games is now a huge, huge business for the entertainment industry. I think it would just kind of be a different option because with with movies, the thing about it and why you have a director is they're the ones who choose what we're focusing on, where in virtual reality, you're kind of choosing okay, I'm going to go here, I'm going to look at that. And, and so I think it's a different type of style. And there probably will be some sort of interactive director, you know, right. something across between maybe like a 
a video game, a showrunner, and a, a movie director that that is in control of how your experience is. Yeah, when you go see Creed Eight, you, you're gonna have options. You can either go watch somebody get punched, or you can go be the guy getting his ass kicked in a ring for twelve rounds. I choose the former. All right, what's next? Jeffrey Nunez writes, how important is it for a movie franchise to have known actors? Could Marvel or DC make a comic book movie without un or with unknown actors? Well, I mean, someone like a Chris Hemsworth was not relatively unknown yeah. when he did Thor. Chris Evans was known, but he wasn't a big A-list star. I, 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 the day of big movie actors kind of carrying films is over. It's all about franchises. Yeah, and Downey wasn't an A-list star when he got Iron right, Man. He was, he he was recognizable. Right. He was recognizable maybe as much for bad stuff as for good stuff, and now he obviously is back on the A-list. That's what Marvel can do for you, is they can put you on the A-list. You do not have to start out on the A-list or even be on a radar, but Marvel is one of those few properties they can put you into something, and all of a sudden you're a star, kid. Well, there's a lot of times that they, they don't want the big stars because they can lock the small smaller stars or the people like Robert Downey Jr. into long contracts because they don't have a lot going on at that moment. Or you know, it, it's And you look at something like Star Wars, most of the people in The Force Awakens, pretty unknown. Yeah. Even someone like Andy Serkis, who we all know, Andy Serkis is known, like most common, uh, like just average film goers don't really know who Andy Serkis is. A lot yeah. of people, film fans do. People watching this show, of course, you, you know who Andy is. But I think John Boyega, Daisy Ridley did nothing. She did absolutely nothing. And she's going to be very recognizable. It's another way to lock people into contracts, but it's from listening to what like JJ said. It's what he did when, when we watched the original Star Wars movies and you saw Luke and Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford and all this. You didn't say, oh, there's this, this movie star. There's, you said, no, that's Luke, that's Leia, and that's Han. And that's what JJ wanted to do. And that's what I think the Marvel films are doing now. There are some stars they put in there as well that... that fit in but I think it's a great way to go Here, here's the question though is that like, like most of the superheroes that unknowns play we know who those superheroes are like if you give me 20 bucks a day I'll play your Hulk but they needed Paul Rudd to be Ant-Man I think it right. would have been harder yeah, right. to cast that's a good point. an unknown as Ant-Man so if it's a smaller movie and you're basing the entire character around there but that's what they were able to do what? however Chadwick Boseman is not very known at all um, and he's playing Black Panther, but he's being introduced in Civil War. Which everybody's which, gonna see. Right, yeah. so I think that that's, that's the right. kind of a mixture of the two is where Ant-Man came out first, so they had to get someone like Paul Rudd, and you get Chadwick Boseman to say, okay, he's, he's going to go out, and, and look at Spider-Man, look at the kid, that, I don't even know, remember the kid's name. You don't need him to play Spider-Man because it's Spider-Man, the character's bigger than the actor. And he had, uh, speaking of Chris Evans in Captain America, he, I remember for his contract, I think he only got paid like 300 grand for the first Captain America. Obviously, he's getting paid a lot more now, but that's how they do it. They, right. they make get someone that's not a huge star, give them these contracts, and say, okay, well, if you do it for a long time, you're going to get paid out. And then you have something like the X Men Days of Future Past. Like now you have Jennifer Lawrence and Michael Fassbender right. and, 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 and Hugh Jackman. Like, but. You know, before like none of those people were huge. Uh, Hugh Jackman he became big off of, of Wolverine, off of X Men, yep. and both that literally role. and figuratively yeah, he and, became big off Wolverine. And Jennifer Lawrence signed on while she was doing Hunger Games as well too. And during the, during the X Men First Class is when that movie blew up, the, the, and she was known as Katniss. And then oh now she's also known as Mystique. But Fassbender, yeah, Fassbender has kind of made a name with movie audiences, like uh, com commercial audiences, as Magneto. Yeah. All right, uh, one more. All right, since we're talking about comic books, uh, Adam writes, which of the seven comic book movies next year do you think is going to be your favorite, not the best? Hmm, man. Civil War or Suicide Squad? Those are the two I think they're going to be I'm going out. Batman v Superman because it's not only Batman versus Superman. As we know from the trailer, it's the dawn of justice, kids. I'm looking forward to seeing the little Easter eggs they put in there about the other Justice League members. Plus, you get to see Batman. You get to see the Batman that we never thought we'd get to see on screen. An older, grizzled, pissed off, semi-retired Brett Favre coming out of retirement Batman. That's the guy I always thought, well, you're never going to see that on the big screen. Now we get it. I think it'll probably be Captain America Civil War, but... Maybe Batman v Superman will surprise me. I think I think before this this last trailer, I might have said Batman v Superman, but now I'm a little bit nervous. Don't sleep on Suicide Squad. Which one is the lock to be to be at least really good? Civil War. Civil War. It's got to be Civil War, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but the wild card is obviously Deadpool because Deadpool could be hilarious and great action. But I'm going back. I'm kind of worried Deadpool may fall under the radar like a like a kick ass where it's like good but because it's rated r it's it's less you know it's more limited i mean obviously it's going to do better than kick ass because of 
the the, the name of it, but right. I, but I that's money wise. The quality wise, yeah. it might might it might actually help. Colossus it. shows up too, just to give that little X Men push. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for watching this episode. I want to thank the people joining me at this table. Mark, where can people find you? Uh, online at fifty one fifty Ellis on Twitter and Instagram. This weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I'm at the world famous Comedy Store. I just added St. Louis to the calendar. You can get tickets to my 2016 tour at markellislive.com. And Christian? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ray for sleeping in the back. Um, and I uh, I would actually like to tell you guys about my Periscope. Make sure you guys, a bunch of you guys followed me on Periscope yesterday because we're going to be live streaming our time at the Force Awakens premiere. So I'll, I, like, I was like 4,000 of you yesterday. Thank you for doing that. And make sure you check out Jedi Council. It's up from yesterday's episode. Tiffany Smith made her first appearance yesterday as a full-time council member at Christian Harloff, Twitter, and Instagram. And Natasha, where can people find you? All right. Well, first of all, thank you guys for a lovely second show. You guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Uh, this is going to be probably my last show until uh, the next time I'm on. I'm going I'm to have seen Star Wars. Woohoo! You guys. We are, all are. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, you I'm guys on do Monday. Monday. You're on Monday. So, <laughs> but, yeah, next time I will have seen Star Wars and hopefully, yeah, we can talk I hope you more, like about, <laughs> more about that. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash collider videos. And we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.